ahead and get started. Um, so welcome to Institutionalizing Collaboration, Urban Perspectives, uh, the first of four um, conversations that we're going to ha be having across the month of April, really around the topic of how do we uh, most successfully uh, and impactfully um, develop uh, relationships uh, and then use those relationships uh, in ways um, that will drive cultures of health in our communities. Um, so this session, we're going to explore how urban libraries in Maryland, North Carolina, and Illinois have navigated partnerships um, around a variety of topics. Um, and so uh, for those of you uh, who didn't join us for our kickoff, um, uh, we'd love to know uh, who you are. Um, and even if you did join us, uh, there's some new people. So just take a moment before we um, uh, shift uh, into our uh, panel to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, what brings you here today? Uh, who are you? Where are you? And what do you hope to gain or contribute? Um, and as you're inputting uh, that in the chat, um, I'm going to ask uh, um, my uh, assistant, Amelia Medrano, uh, to put uh, into the chat uh, a link uh, to the Jamboard from our opening session. And uh, so you can see what, uh, what we all uh, discussed earlier this afternoon. But just, uh, just to kind of transition to today, um, I'm Noah Lenstra. Uh, I'm an associate professor of library and information science at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, and with the financial support of the Institute of Museum and Library Services uh, during the past three years, um, I've had this really unique uh, and very um, amazing opportunity to talk with about 130 uh, individuals and 18 communities. Um, about 70 library workers, uh, including the four uh, workers uh, that we'll be, we'll be talking with today, um, as well as 50 community partners, um, really focused on trying to understand uh, from kind of a 360 degree perspective, um, what does it look like when librarians uh, and partners come together um, to, to support and create uh, uh, community, community health um, and, and all of its permutations, but with a particular focus on on, on physical activity and, and healthy eating. Um, and so I'm really thrilled uh, today uh, to uh, bring, bring to the, the table, as it were, um, four, four librarians uh, from Illinois, Maryland, and North Carolina that I had the, the opportunity to talk with. Um, and just to kind of set the stage, uh, this, this conversation and our subsequent conversations is really our attempt um, to have that virtual equivalent uh, of those conference sessions that I'm sure many of you have been to, in which you have some people kind of sitting around on big comfy chairs up on the stage, <laughs> kind of talking and conversing. Um, and so that, that's kind of the, 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 um, what we're aiming for today. We want this to be informal, engaging, but also um, really inviting for you uh, to share uh, your own experiences as well. Um, and just before uh, we segue into that conversation, I just want to do some quick introductions uh, for our panelists. Um, so uh, Becky Hass uh, uh, creates Brave Space for Community Conversations. Um, uh, she brings more than 15 years of experience um, uh, in various leadership capacities. Um, uh, her areas of focus are wholehearted leadership, organizational development, uh, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. As a programming and outreach manager of Anne Arundel County Library, she supports hundreds of community partners um, uh, through a process she describes as program matchmaking, which uh, I'm so excited to, to have you um, share more about. Um, and Becky is on a mission to support joyful, resilient individuals and communities where all can use their agency to empower their goals. Uh, Stacy Rausch uh, is the director of Branch Library Services at the Gail Borden uh, Public Library District in Elgin, Illinois. With over 17 years of library work experience, uh, she specializes in project management, public programs, partnerships, and grant writing and management. Uh, and she earned her MLIS degree from San Jose State University in 2018. Welcome, Stacy. Uh, Anna Devine is the Division Chief of Community Services, also at the Gail Borden Library District. Um, earned her MLIS uh, from Dominican University, um, and she's been at uh, her library for over 20 years. Um, prior to joining the administration, she was the Director of Neighborhood Services. Um, um, 
And uh, we're going to talk with Anna about some of the amazing work that she's done over the years. Um, and last but certainly not least um, is Maxine Days, um, MLIS, uh, who has worked with the city of High Point um, at the High Point Public Library for over 25 years. Um, serving in a variety of roles, uh, including after-school program coordinator, research librarian, and event coordinator. Uh, in addition to her primary reference duties, uh, Maxine teaches basic skills uh, computer class and collaborates with local artists to showcase their creative artistry. She also plans uh, and organizes events like the Black Expo, Community Cultural Festival, also short showcase breast cancer awareness, a uh, heart healthy campaign, and the health fair. Um, and Maxine believes that forming partnerships is key to promoting community growth um, and that it enhances the well-being of others. Um, so welcome, Maxine, Anna, Stacy, and Becky. Um, and just a quick housekeeping, uh, at any point, uh, you are invited to um, put things in the chat questions. I'll try to keep an eye on that. We also have um, Amelia Medrano keeping an eye on the chat. Um, you can put a q and A in. So definitely, uh, if, if anything comes to mind that you'd like to learn more about, uh, just put it in. Um, but I'm going to kick off the conversation uh, by getting everyone's thoughts about how, how do we most effectively uh, invite partners into the library. Um, and Maxine, um, I wanted to start with you. Um, through your health fairs and other programs, you've brought an incredible array of community partners uh, into your library. Maxine, could you tell us uh, how you get health partners to come to your library? And how do you do this work most effectively? Good afternoon. Thank everyone for coming out. And thank you, Nora, for inviting me to be a part of this discussion and organizing this awesome organization, this discussion for this afternoon. Um, what I do is, first of all, I think about how and what our customers are looking for. Um, sometimes I may do a survey, but mostly I look at different companies, um, even the colleges in the area, before I reach out and see what they're doing, how they're networking with other agencies in the community. Then I go and talk or I cold call. Um, a lot of times it's word of mouth. Um, I also rely on my coworkers because they're out in the community, they're meeting people, they're talking with other library customers. So that gives me a base of hearing about what people are looking for, what they might be interested in, and that helps me to put together or create a list that I can work from when I start to reach out and go out into the community. And one of the ways in when I go out into the community is um, networking and attending other events. That gives me a large variety of people that I can connect with and just start the partnership and understanding what their values and what their interest is for the community before I can bring someone in to say partner with the library. Yeah, I, I love that, Maxine. And I love what you talk about using word of mouth, using the knowledge of all of your coworkers, going out and attending events in which a lot of partners are going to be present, um, and then inviting them to come into the library. Just just wonderful. Um, and Becky, I'd love to, love to now turn to you. Um, uh, and one of the interviews uh, I did uh, uh, with a staff member of the Anne Arundel County Health Department, um, uh, a public health professional told me uh, that uh, she fondly recalled uh, being invited uh, by you <laughs> uh, to come down to the Anne Arundel County Library's administrative offices and get to get to meet some of the administrative staff. Uh, um, and so shifting it from a branch to a system level partnership. Um, can you can you tell us a bit about how how you invite kind of partners in for that more strategic planning uh, type discussion? Absolutely. So a lot of it comes down to relationship. Um, I think at that point we had been in a couple of meetings together and started with listening, listening to some of her goals, some of their strategic plan, and then recognizing where there were these moments of alignment, really simple things that we could support. So it was almost that reference interview moment, right, where we're in the room with our partners and getting curious, asking questions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, is, what does this look like for you? Because 
they're going to have a different perspective. So it was, it was really a lot of fun. That was the other thing, right? We were having a great time in that room, getting um, imaginative and giving ourselves permission to think out of the box. You know, there was a lot of barriers with um, physical buildings, like, well, we don't know where we're going to do this. And I was like, well, maybe we could pilot at the library. You know, we have a space. Come, come yeah. use the library, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that little moment of permission slip was transformative for them, for us. Um, and I think the term pilot, like, I know we say it a lot, but I really do think that that framing, right? You're allowed to try new things at the library. Mm -hmm. Let's do it together, right? Mm -hmm. And then that gave a different um, agency for them and for us to bring resources, to try new things, to, um, to bring a different perspective of what partnership could look like. And then it kind of exploded from there. Mm -hmm. I, I love that, Becky, and I love that that ethos of kind of, um, yeah, let's let's kind of really explore and, and not let kind of um, hindrances stand in our way as we're kind of exploring what this partnership could look like um, and not being afraid to try new things. Um, uh, just really quickly, one one thing that I forgot to do, and Amelia in a moment is going to put a link uh, into the chat um, is, is we all are talking uh, in the Zoom room about about how we kind of invite uh, invite partners to work with us. Um, uh, we're, we also have created a Jamboard where you can uh, share some of the strategies that you've used at your library so everyone can kind of uh, contribute to this, this kind of collective uh, brainstorming. Um, but I, I'd now love to, to shift from Maryland to Illinois, which uh, is where I grew up. Uh, <laughs> I grew up um, uh, in Northwest Illinois, kind of, um, and, but um, na uh, on the other side of the state, uh, Elgin is uh, in the Chicago metro area, Fox River Valley. Um, and Anna, um, uh, I now want to shift uh, to you, so, um, and I, I want to expand the conversation just for a moment beyond health, because um, um, I think that so often these, these, these relationships can be used for a lot of different things, not just for health, uh, but for education. And at your library in Elgin, one of your biggest successes was the Gold Star Partners um, Summer Reading Program, uh, Community Collaborative. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that initiative and how you strategically recruited uh, 25 partners uh, to collaborate with you on that effort? Sure, thank you. And well, like a lot of good things, they start out as a pilot, as we've already heard. So um, just to give you a little bit of context is how you can start with a, with a nugget and you never know where it's gonna go over time. Um, in 2007, I decided to start something new, and that was, hmm, we have a lot of kids that aren't coming to the library in the summer, and they're unable to do the summer reading program. We all know, we are all public libraries, and summer reading is a big deal, but what happens when children can't, we had built up the system where they had to come into the library, and so I thought, I know, I'm going to find kids out in the community, and I'm going to do a lot of hand-holding. So, my first year, six children finished the summer reading program. Building upon that idea, to give you context, last summer we had almost 5,000 children that finished the summer reading program through Gold Star Partners. So what Gold Star Partners is, is taking the model of working with the people that are in your community, their serving children at day camps, parks and recs, at a variety of places, the police department, summer school, uh, social service organizations, faith-based organizations, public housing uh, authority. We just went and found where our children in the summer. And instead of little old me trying to handhold, you know, a half a dozen kids to finish a summer reading program, we um, basically deputized people in the community and they facilitated children reading at their sites. So we empowered them, we gave them books, we gave them the structure. Uh, they finished a summer reading program, just like anybody coming into the library, they get their free book, they get all of the same prizes, but we're doing it through people that are already serving children. 
And so actually you said that we had 25 partners last summer, we were actually at 49 different sites in the community. And um, so what can start with just a pilot, a, an idea can really transform uh, who you're able to reach. I, I love that, uh, um, Anna, and, and it really also uh, resonates with what Becky said uh, a moment ago about kind of, um, yeah, letting people know, like, um, we, we want uh, you to use our space. Uh, we want you to, as you say, kind of be deputized uh, to go out and, and do the work. And, and, and I think uh, creating, creating pathways and, and conduits um, for, for kind of that, that kind of greatness to come together is, is really, really profound. Um, um, uh, Stacy, um, I'd love to learn just uh, about a different facet now of kind of the work that you all do in Elgin, Illinois. Um, uh, uh, one of the programs uh, that you know um, I, I got to learn a lot about in my interviews was uh, the Rayco Rangers program. Um, uh, could you just tell us a little bit about Rayco Rangers, what the Rayco branch uh, as outdoor uh, initiative looks like? Um, and, and tell us about some of the strategies that you've used to invite uh, in partners to do, do things with you um, in your outdoor space. Yes, absolutely. So let me share my screen. I have some photos. Here we go. So let's see. Um, so as we're talking about kind of uh, increasing partnerships for wellness and health, Another element could be seen as getting people out into na nature and uh, learning through those experiences as well. So this is our RACO branch. This is one of the branches that I help oversee in Elgin, Illinois. And what's unique about our branch is that we are surrounded by native plants, wildflowers, wildlife. We see hawks and cranes. And I heard the frogs this morning as I was coming into work. Um, and so we love that we have this beautiful landscape that surrounds us. So we do a lot of programming um, based on science and nature. This is our backyard behind the library. You can see how beautiful it is in the summer. We have a walking path back there. We also raise butterflies in the summer. Um, we have a butterfly garden in the back. You can see this is one of our programs. Um, where the kids are learning about the butterflies. We release them in our backyard. We also have vegetable gardens that we maintain and work with volunteers on. We have this pond in our backyard as well. So we've done pond scooping, pond ecology programs. So we've been doing this. We've been open since 2009, this specific branch. Um, and in about around 2020, we were approached by the Wild Ones, um, a local chapter, and they wanted to just uh, do programming with the library in general. And really they were focusing more on adult programming, Zoom programming, um, and we were invited to the table, the branch services, and we thought, what can we do by using the really beautiful landscape and the features of the branch? So, um, we thought, we said, we're in the middle of COVID. We have staff that need something to do, keep busy. We have very talented staff who are artists and really interested in nature. We were also not doing any in-person programming at the time. So how do we do these things um, and use our building as the gift? So Wild Ones had tagged their program, Start In Your Yard. And so we thought we'll create an element of this program and find partners um, and we'll start in our backyard at Rayco Branch. And that's what we really wanted to highlight. Um, and so our portion of Start in Your Yard was designed to get children outside, to learn about nature, um, to invite them to Rayco to do outdoor programming. Um, and so we had outdoor programming and virtual programming. And I'm Proud to say we're now on year three of Rayco Rangers. Um, Anna, if you could put that link in the chat so people can see our webpage, that would be great. So the first year, our staff um, completely created a coloring book. That, that one in the middle here, all of the artwork is originally made by one of our staff members. 
And then all of the information is compiled and edited by another staff member. Um, and so each year has taken on a new initiative or a new product, I would like to say. So the first year was a coloring book, which really featured the native plants and wildlife that you could find at this branch's backyard. So if you were gonna walk around this library, what would you see? So birds and bees and butterflies. Um, we had pond scooping on there as well. And then we did a series of videos um, with other partners for, we worked with our friends of the Fox River to do a pond scooping video with us. Um, we also worked with an author of a children's book who did not live near us, but we zoomed him in and did an interview with him for a, um, a video it was called The Puddle Garden. Um, and then we also, I don't think I have a photo, we also started a story walk as well um, that we set up along the outside of the Reiko branch where you could read The Puddle Garden as you walked through nature. So it was this opportunity that this partner approached us with that really our talented staff just exploded into this children's programming that we're now doing every year. Um, you can see Roger, our mascot up here. Roger is our Reiko Ranger that staff has created. And even one of our staff created a stuffed version of him um, that the kids love to see as well. So it started with such a small idea that um, staff really just got behind and we're really using the strengths of the branch um, in tune with the wild ones and partners that want to get involved. So in the second year, we created a field guide. You can see that on our web page. And then the second year, we really focused on getting families out to our local forest preserves. So we've partnered with our local forest preserve districts to identify really beautiful forest preserves within our district, we actually set up signs in the forest preserves where people would have to find the sign, find a secret word and write it down in their field guide. So it encouraged families to get out and hike together. Um, we were also inspired by our local forest preserve. They have circulating backpacks based on nature themes. So we started our Rako Rangers backpack collection that year as well. So you can check out a backpack from the Reiko branch with, um, there's different themes. One is tree exploration, one is insects, and then this year is about soil. And so you get identification guides, books, you get you know maybe a shovel or binoculars or a pond scooping kit, that type of thing that you get to check out and use while you're outside as well. Um, we also partnered with the Forest Preserve, they would have summer camps and they asked us to do story times at those summer camps because they thought we can do the nature part, but you guys are the experts on story time. So could we work together on this? So sort of like we were asking them to help with our program and they were asking us to help with their program as well. Um, yeah, um, and and Stacy, I'm I may uh, just jump in because uh, I think that's actually the perfect perfect segue to kind of the the second second half uh, of our conversation, which is um, shifting from how do we invite uh, partners uh, in to thinking about how do we how do we go out um, and kind of um, uh, go into partner spaces. So that's a, a perfect example of kind of. Um, at the Reiko branch, uh, you really thought strategically about how you could play to your strengths. Uh, we have artistic staff. We have this beautiful space. Let's think about how we can contribute that to the, um, this this focus on trying to get get people more connected with nature um, and engaged in in, in nature based learning. Um, and then from that, uh, it led to opportunities to have staff go out and continue to play to their strengths by doing story times um, at some of the partner sites. So, so just just beautiful. Um, uh, just as we transition to the second half, uh, Amelia, um, do you want to put the link into our second jam board? So we're now going to transition from how do we invite partners in um, to how do we how do we uh, as librarians go out. Um, both uh, to engage our partners in, in brainstorming in their spaces, but then also to go out to deliver deliver programming um, and to kind of make that transition. Becky, um, 
Uh, I want to ask you about uh, an initiative that uh, you and I have discussed, um, and I've had the great privilege to learn about, um, but uh, maybe maybe do information for many of the, the people on this call, um, which is uh, the Casey Family Programs uh, Communities of Hope uh, Initiative. Um, could you could you tell us a little bit more about uh, about what that initiative entails? Um, how how your library got involved with it, um, and how it rippled out from the original community of hope uh, in Brooklyn Park um, to communities across Anne Arundel County. Sure, I mean I could talk about that all day, quite frankly. Um, so this is one of my favorite parts of my job, um, and it really came. It started about eight years ago. Um, and it was a collaboration. It was community getting together and recognizing some of our challenges, looking at the data and getting really honest about it, talking honestly about things like the color of poverty and what does that mean and how does it show up and how does that impact our work? Um, Anne Arundel County is geographically a pretty big space. We have 16 branches including Annapolis, and it goes from the edge of Baltimore City all the way down into Deal, which is marinas and farmland. So I kind of see it as like a little um, mini version of the whole country, quite frankly. Um, and so it, it, it does require different approaches. We, we use the term tailored service. Um, and the framework really gives us, uh, for, it, it gives us the capacity to think about things like our collective impact, Right? We work smarter together, harder. We have more impact when we're in the room trying to work on things collaboratively. Um, and then it also uses uh, another framework, which is results-based accountability. And what I love about that comes down to two questions. And we use these in every planning session, every conversation, every debrief. Are we doing the right things and are we doing them well? And we get really curious about that. And sometimes it's messy and hard and we make mistakes. And I think the real bottom line goal on this is that we want to plan with our community and not at, that we're actually part of an ecosystem of support of, of people. And that it's allowed to look different for different places, that it probably should actually, because we're not a cookie. You can't cookie cutter because this is people and community. So yeah, there is a spine sort of backbone organization. Um, that's our local management board, um, the Partnership for Children, Youth and Families. And they take the lead on orchestrating the meetings. Um, they lead us through what they call turn the curve activities where we recognize where the, where the curve is going. Right, we know the numbers, and even if you don't have the numbers, we still know, is it going the way we want it to be going? And if not, how do we change the direction, right? And then working with families, with community, with religious organizations, nonprofits, business, it's a really beautiful tapestry of people that are in the room. There are many listening sessions, and there's a lot of real intentionality um, around how we create our community plan and the map is part of it but the story is part of it too so it's it's been a real blessing um, to be part of that work brooklyn park um, working with the director there hosting things sometimes it's just passing out a flyer right those low-hanging fruit moments we underestimate the power of our bulletin boards um, so sometimes it's those moments and then incrementally we have those little small wins and then that builds momentum toward maybe a bigger project, a bigger pilot, um, something maybe between communities, maybe there's overlap. Um, and so, yeah, it's now expanded into work with military around Fort Meade, south into um, some of the marine and farmland spaces and the library is there. We're part of the community. And especially in South County, you know, there aren't a lot of other agencies present. So that gives the library a unique opportunity to not only be in the room, but sometimes be the room. Um, and that's been really impactful in showing our value um, and then adding value to some of this planning, 
uh, hosting listening sessions. Um, yeah, it's looked like a lot of different things over the years. And yeah, pretty impactful work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Becky. And and yeah, um, and hopefully we will be able to have a, a much longer conversation about the Communities of Hope framework, but it, it is really impactful. And and I love just the idea of kind of multi-sector organizing. Um, and I'll, I'll just really quickly share one concrete example about how I learned uh, the Anne Arundel County Library was able to contribute. Um, so is in Brooklyn Park, uh, in that that initial community of hope, there was a, a lot of discussion about food uh, insecurity um, in planning for uh, a food pantry, a community-based food pantry. Um, and some of the library staff uh, at the Brooklyn Park branch were able to contribute some of their expertise on volunteer management. Um, and uh, because, yeah, I mean, <laughs> libraries rely on volunteers, um, but uh, I think it was kind of the type of thing like um, no one no one necessarily thought, oh, we, we need to start a volunteer management structure for this food pantry. Let's go reach out to our librarians. Uh, but because the librarian was part of the, the multi-sector organization, they were able to speak up and offer that expertise in a really impactful way. Um, so anyway, yeah, um, really impactful. Um, Maxine, I'd love to just ask you kind of a similar question. Uh, one, one thing that uh, I noticed, so you mentioned you've worked for the library for, or I, I, I should say I mentioned, <laughs> you told me that you've worked for the library for 25 years. Um, and and you, one of the things that I noticed in when our call is that you're able to really just um, use your incredible wealth of knowledge about who's who in High Point uh, to help help get things done. Um, <laughs> could you tell us about how your knowledge of the community helps you when you go out uh, into the community to engage uh, with potential partners? Um, and as, as you're talking, I'll just quickly, Maxine also shared uh, with me some images of her work. Um, and I'll just have these kind of playing uh, as you're discussing, Maxine. But yeah, go ahead, Maxine. Thank you, that's a good question. Um, when thinking about going out into the community, I do consider the population. That is very key to me in knowing and having a grasp for who we're going to serve. Um, when I'm trying to partner, I'm looking at the types of services they're offering. How, how will their time fit into what we're seeking and for as time customers are able to access the service that they're going to provide? Um, with that comment, if you go down one of my slides talks about tabling information. And if you go to the next, keep going, keep going. We're gonna go kind of back and forth a little bit here, but the very next slide on this slide, because we're talking about time and being able to offer services to people that otherwise wouldn't know what's going on or how to access different things. In these pictures, this is where I schedule monthly um, organizations to come into the library and be available to showcase what they're doing in the community. And for an example, the one with Lenny the Frog, um, that's with our city of High Point stormwater team. And they're talking about how to protect the stormwaters. Usually we would think, well, who cares? And some people don't, don't really consider it, but it's key and it's important not to throw things in there. So we do have people coming to the library each month and talk about that, um, giving out some prizes sometimes and just letting them see what happens when people just not as aware or conscious of what's going on. The um, lady in the green simple gesture, she comes once a month and now she's coming and participating with, our, um, tai Chi, with the yoga class. But um, what happens with her, she's able to sign people up it's all free and they fill up one of those green bags for the month and they fill it up with non-perishable food items and then when they go and they'll go and pick up the food bag and take it to different shelters so the food not only stays in one agency but we're helping the community we're feeding those that are in need for food um the two gentlemen next to that picture, they're with what is called Oak Street Health, and they're in the library monthly sharing information and making connection and talking about the great service that they offer, which is community health. And a lot of their service is free that they provide. They do a number of monthly activities, so that so much so they play games. They um, Right now, this month, I was working with them on um, signing up the seniors to get um, household products. So they would circle whatever products they need 
and those items will be delivered to them. So again, this partnership, this networking is a win-win in all situations because there are people that need and they come to the library. The library is, I call it my community hub. I call it the, um, it's, a, it's a market. So you, but you're not paying and we're able to tap into or connect with partnering agencies that is able and willing to provide their service to the library. So if we scroll back up here, this is a part of when I do my health fair um, and health fair last year, if you keep going, scroll to the next top that. Last year's was um, our health fair, which was dormant for about two years due to COVID, of course. And last year was centered around colon um, cancer or colon, the colon itself. And fortunately, we were able to get this colon sent to us. Another company in Florida partnered with the library, saw what we were doing here, and was willing to allow us to utilize this gigantic inflatable colon. It was really cool. That's me standing there just to give an idea of how big this thing was for people to walk through, take pictures, and you can feel the texture of what the colon would look like when it's damaged. Um, so this was just really an interesting um, piece of equipment. It's funny because it, when it was shipped, it was sitting in the entrance to the staff interest area and people walking by and see this big old case and it's like okay what's in there but this was a unique um fun and interesting object to have out in our um health fair last year if you go back down to the next slide so here was some of the um partnering agencies that came out and participate guilford county reentry is for um those that were incarcerated so they're able to help them they're partnering with those people and working with them to keep them from not going back into the system. Um, the picture to your right with this lady in the blue was very interesting. This was the first time coming to the library and participating as a partner. And now it's an ongoing thing because what has happened, she just happened to saw someone walking around with some pretty worn out shoes. So she reached out to me the very next day and was talking about what she can do because she works with an agency called Fleet Feet. And what they do, of course, their shoes are, to me, high-end sneakers that they sell. Um, but people are able to exchange or return um, gently used shoes so that they can get the right shoe. So in turn, she says she gets a lot of shoes returned, not a lot returned, but over a period of time, she has shoes and they've been sending them out of the country. But now after being here, they're bringing them to the local um, homelessness shelters or service partnering agencies and making a donation there. So there you're putting the service and putting the help back into our community versus it being sent somewhere else. So that was a win-win. And it was just a matter of her being here outside because last year we had the um, health fair, both indoors where I do the screenings or have screenings conducted. And then the other part is outside, which was really nice. The other slide is um, called micro greens and it's growing greens that doesn't get big. They're tiny, just as you see them on the table here. But she talks about how you can grow your own and how edible they are immediately. You don't, you don't need to wait for to get huge you can pick them and eat now. Um, the other very bottom picture is the Lions Club. And they're, of course, for vision. And they offer a lot of service to the community. Um, glassware. Matter of fact, here at the library, we keep a box for people to donate their um, unwanted or discarded eyewear. And then I in turn, when the box is full, I call them and they come and pick it up. And those eyewears are being sent, refurbished, and able to cut back into the community to help those that are not able to purchase glasses. Um, matter of fact, we had a vision clinic this past Saturday here at the library with the High Point Lions Club. Physician came over. They have this huge bus and um, were able to service over 35 people within a couple of hours um, with eye screenings and eye exams. And they'll try and work with people with getting the eyewear. But that was just awesome um, for them to come over and offer that free service. Um, 
Now you can scroll back up. Here, um, here at the library, I, I do a lot of programming and just trying to make sure that we're networking and partnering. Um, agencies are willing to help. The colleges, local universities are big um, supporters for the library and coming out. But on this day, we did our Veterans Day celebration and that was a really heartfelt um, event. The veterans that came was very pleased and thankful of people just thinking about them and wanting to recognize and show the love to them and their working and their um, servicing of the country. So at the bottom is um, students from High Point Central High School. They are what they call posting the colors um, at this time. So we had the first part of the event was outdoors um, and then we came in. Um, for this event, we had several, three different news stations came out and viewed the whole event, which was really nice. And the top picture to your right is what is called um, Trees of Valor. And this is um, done by one of the ladies in the community. Um, it's a Chris, just a tree. However, you're able to post family members on this tree. So there were several of these that were posted in the library for this event. And the picture, the very first picture to your right was really interesting. You may think, what are they doing with the box? It just looks like a registration station, but it's not. Um, because at this event, I also had some health vendors to come out. There were different um, veterans or military type service um, agencies came and participate. And one of the health organizations were the Brain Injury Association of North Carolina. And with this, she bought this activity, but it's a box. And you look in the box and the key is trying to simulate what it's like for someone that had a brain injury. And it's not easy because even though you can look down through that hole and you may see your hand moving, when I tried it, there were times my hand wouldn't even move. To me, it was like my hand just stuck. So it takes a lot of concentration to try and simulate what is like for someone who's had a brain injury on and, and just being able to function. So that was a really interesting little um, item or activity for people to become engaged in that she brought along as far as the health goes for the event. Um, if you, so we'll, we'll stop there for now. Did it? Or can I yeah, keep... no, I I think that that's great, Maxine. Um, and and I'd love to just just kind of quickly follow up. Uh, uh I mean, you, the, I'm sure all all these amazing things that you've you've been able to bring to your library are are a part, uh, a product of just um the incredible amount of networking, uh, and kind of relationship building. Um, and so I'd love to hear Maxine. Um, and and others uh, as well. Um. If 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 people don't already have all these relationships with all these amazing partners, um, what would Maxine? What would be your advice in terms of how to get started in terms of building building your network of of partners? Networking and attending other types of um, programs or um, events in in the community. Most events are generally free um, that you can just go and talk. Um, People are willing to share, they want to be a part. And when you tell them it's for the library, well, they know you're servicing the community. And with you strengthen the library, you strengthen the community, then it helps people get well, it helps people build um, better strategies for themselves. And it also bring them into the library. My thing is to bring more here. And each event I have, somebody say, well, this is my first time here, or I didn't know you had all this. So you want them to become and not, not only bring their services, but become engaged with the library. Get a library card, because I'll tell them at one of my events, the gentleman was leaving and um, I was I had, I had was putting things back because I go back and shift and put stuff back. And there was a cart of um, DVD videos that was for sale. And he's like, what are you doing with those old videos? I bet you don't have a Western. So that, I was like, uh-uh, we're going to find it. And I did it. So now he was obligated to purchase. He's like, and he purchased four of them that was sitting there. So there, there are ways in which you want to just get people engaged, but attend other events. Um, talk with your coworkers. 
because they're there, they're there, they're in other departments. Sometimes we don't see each other every day, but I still go and talk and they can share, um, be open to um, receive um, suggestions, um, being able to um, want to accept the um, suggestions that are being made. So just keep an open mind, being willing to share, open, open your heart to say, this is what we're doing. Can you partner with us? Can you share what you have to offer? And people want to share and participate um, a lot and ask questions because customers, library customers, they want to know what's going on and they'll tell you what they're looking for. They, they come in, they'll say, well, next thing you do. So yeah, you, you want to, it becomes a all working parts together because one person can't do it, two people can't do it. But if we share the load, um, invite, um, sometimes delegate somebody to say, would you mind talking with so-and-so? Or are you on this team? Or I, I, it was said that you're part of the board. Can you ask? So just ask. Um, lots of emailing I have to do, which it's very, very time consuming. But um, I love it. And I love to see people coming in and, and just getting the information, being connected to the service that they need or didn't even know existed. So there again, go out and, and, and ask. I love that, Maxine. And thank you for sharing your passion and all this information. And, and I love kind of seeing how also uh, the different partners that come to your library get better connected with one another with that example yes. of the, the fleet feet uh, being a beautiful um, uh, example. I now uh, just uh, want to want to transition to asking Stacy and Anne to talk a little bit about kind of um, how how they have uh, at the Gale Borden Library. I, I consider a somewhat unique uh, but but also very impactful way to kind of get out into the community, wherein um, uh, you have uh, some some dedicated staff member who, staff members who who aren't necessarily working at one of your branch locations, but are instead kind of working um, in the community, um, in particular with uh, with older adult, um, Hispanic, uh, K-12, and, and others. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit about kind of, um, yeah, how, how having these dedicate, designated focused outreach staff um, uh, helps your library engage some of the, the different sectors of your communities? Um, and then also how, how kind of these, these outreach uh, personnel kind of close the loop um, and bring some of the, the resources that they, they've identified out into the community back into your, your three branches. Um, yeah, tell, could you tell us a little bit more about that structure? Um... We're very, very uh, fortunate. We do have a community services division, which the branches are part of. But within that, we also have a communi uh, community engagement department and mobile library services. Uh, wasn't always this way. It just kept growing. You know, we had uh, one person doing preschool visits, you know, about 20 some years ago. And then you just see the need and it grows. And then you add another person and then you have home services and then you add a bookmobile then you we have a technomobile and we have people that that is their dedicated job so with in the situation of life enrichment which you alluded to uh i think glenna was mentioned here she is our um life enrichment manager and she has um, a group of volunteers, but they go into about 24 care facilities monthly. And um, they work closely with the home services and, and the delivery system, but they do programming. They were really instrumental in starting the dementia friendly chapter here in Elgin um, with the memory cafes and uh, educating other community members on being dementia friendly. And I wanted to tag on to something Maxine was saying. What, what we do with, with our staff is, you know, we talk about how do we build those partnerships? How do we find them? One way is that we have these dedicated staff members, especially in our community engagement team, they're sitting on boards. We, um, we have people that are on the history museum board, on um, health service boards. Um, I just got... Um, put on the housing authority board in Elgin, um, the you know, natural museum, all of these various advocacy and uh, committee work that's being done. 
Uh, we have our people deployed to be sitting on those boards. That's where you're going to be rubbing shoulders with the people that have shared mission and values. And I think that's the easiest thing. If, if you don't know where to start, find with somebody in your community that has shared values and uh, you're going to bring something for them. But a good partnership is always both ways. And I found that it's not always just here we are. What can we do for you? Mm -hmm. It's always better and stronger partnership when they're bringing something to the table as well. It's, uh, you know, it's asset based community uh, development, right? We, we all have something we, we bring to the table from our strengths. Mm -hmm. And so having, we do have somebody that is just dedicated to early literacy. That's full time. We have somebody that's dedicated to our uh, elementary schools. We have life enrichment. We have home services. And now we also have a digital equity person. And we're very fortunate to also have vehicles uh, that we can get out to the community. But all these people work together uh, with partners, not, again, doing something for them. Um, yes, you have to start with the data. We, you know, when we brought in our bookmobile, where do we go? Well, we have to start with mapping. Uh, where do people have library cards? Where don't they? So we have to start somewhere and then we start mapping it out and then you just have to go out there and try. And sometimes it's a success and sometimes something that you think makes sense. Why aren't people coming to the stop um, or on the route? And you can keep trying and trying and trying and you have to figure out what the barriers are and then be willing to change and uh, give it a try, but you know, be able to, to um, respond and, and move. Um, and I think that's what we're really good at is pivoting, not getting too set in our ways uh, because it's gonna change. And you know, COVID did that to all of us. If, if we weren't able to be flexible and pivot, uh, you know, we, we wouldn't have been doing uh, much good in the community. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And that's that's a great, uh, great kind of segue to um, uh, my next question. And, and at this point, I'd love to just also open the floor. So um, if anyone has any any questions or thoughts uh, they'd like to share uh, in the chat, um, uh, and, and Amelia, if there's been any questions that um, have come up, uh, Amelia, just, just interrupt me. Um, but, but kind of piggybacking on what uh, Anna, you just said, um, one thing, uh, particularly in urban communities, uh, there, there's often uh, an abundance of potential partners and potential directions. Um, and, uh, and so the question is, uh, how, how do you most strategically use your time uh, to make the biggest impact? Um, uh, because you can't be uh, everywhere um, at all times. And so, so thinking strategically and uh, uh, Anna, you alluded to using data to figure out kind of priorities, um, um, trying to find uh, organizations where there's that mission alignment. Um, but I'd love to ask uh, Becky, uh, Stacy, Maxine, um, uh, are there any strategies that you all have employed uh, to figure out kind of um, given the, the many different uh, potential directions you all could be going uh, in, in terms of partnerships, how do you decide where, where to most uh, strategically use your and your staff time's energy? So I can speak a bit to that, which is we do it in collaboration and partnership. So we're part of a Healthy Anne Arundel Coalition. So we're working on a plan together. We work on different projects and work groups. Um, and it's in alignment with our strategic plans, right? So that it's it's all connected. It's all supporting this forward momentum together and planning for adaptability, right? Because possibility modeling, we know it's going to be part of the equation so that we can pause and assess and then pivot so that we're making sure that we are working with um, and having those listening sessions. Is this working? asking some of those hard questions. Um, yeah, so so I think the coalition piece is also key um, and those listening groups. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Becky. Uh, Maxine, Stacy, any, any thoughts on that question? 
Let me go first. Sure. Okay. Repeat what you said. Yeah. So, so Maxine, so uh, city of High Point, lots of lots of different organizations, lots of different uh, yeah people to work with. How how do you uh, decide kind of where where to invest your your time in terms of building relationships um, and and expanding your network? Well, it is a juggling act, but but I love it, and I think about um, specifically what program I'm going to work on at that time. Then I begin to prioritize the types of pro service agencies or partners that I want to work with, not so much I want to work with, will, will fit best for the library. How would that fit into the scheme of what we're hoping to accomplish and what we're hope looking for to bring into the library? How can we help those agencies? Because not only them providing all the time, but what can we do for them? And that can be as simply as having some of their flyers or information posted in the library, which we do have kiosks here in the library on the second floor, adult services, we can have their materials posted here. We can share their ongoing materials with the public. Um, prioritizing my time, I try to, I have a weekly journal. So that gives me an idea of what I'm needing to do. If I'm doing program this week, that is the focus along with, of course, my regular library duties but I try to um, stay with this is the project that's at hand or matter at hand for right now. How am I going to make sure that the people are getting what I most beneficial to them in conjunction with the different partners we're going to bring in? And it's also important to evaluate um, when you get an invitation to partner with somebody is how does this relate to library services, our core mission? Um, does it fit? Or does it not? And I think it's okay for us to say that is a great opportunity, but it doesn't quite fit with, you know, our timeline, our staffing, our resources, our mission, um, because you want to be able to defend the work that you do to your taxpayers as saying this is well worth our time to put into this initiative. So I think libraries are often invited to the table because we're a trusted place and a neutral place. And so you just wanna make sure you're being about analytical about um, which opportunities you pick up. Yeah, thank you, Stacey. And I just, uh, Becky um, and Anne Arundel, one, one thing uh, as you were talking, Stacey, it reminded me on the Anne Arundel County Library's program proposal form, they have this question, does this program proposal connect to the Urban Libraries Council statement on race and social equity? So. So I thought that was just an amazing way to really put front and foremost, this is something that uh, is kind of at the center of, of our, our mission as libraries, kind of anti-racism. And we we strategically want to lift up any any work that's trying to trying to advance that. Um but um but yeah, this has been really uh, just amazing. We've covered a lot of ground. Hopefully it's been informative. I, I wanted to just in the time that we have left, uh, we did have a question coming from the audience and I, I think we'll, we'll end there just to, just for the sake of time. Um, but uh, uh, in the, the time that we have left, uh, someone wrote for larger cities, how do you manage to work and pitch pilot programs um, if you need to get approval from say your city council or board of county commissioners? Um, so let's say you have the partners in place. Uh, it looks like everyone's ready to go, but you need to get um, some some permissions from from the city or county or who your board of uh, library board. Um, and so, uh, do any of you have any any experience or advice for how do you how do you pitch uh, something that may be a pilot initiative in terms of getting the powers that, that be <laughs> to to kind of sign on to to what you and your partners want to do? Um, any anyone want to jump in on that? I just want to say that the beauty about pi a pilot project is um, you're testing it. You're not asking for a ton of resources. I don't need all this money. I'm just testing the waters here. And I think it's easier to sort of get permission to, to fail because the stakes aren't so high. I'm not asking for $100,000 for this. Can I have you know $500 in my budget for next year to try this thing? And I think that helps then come to the table for more when you can say, this is really successful, this model is working, and then it can be replicated, um, is a lot easier than 
because let's face it, when we approach something new that we're trying, we don't have everything figured out, right? We, there's no way we, we know what the barriers are going to be, what the problems that are going to arise, and you can manage it when it's a lot smaller and the stakes are, are, are smaller. So I, I would just recommend uh, doing small, figuring it out, and then seeing, is this something workable? and then scaling it um, that way. No, I would just add another thing that's been really instrumental in our success, simple things like code design, right? I have an idea, I present it to Department of Social Services. We both have a proposal where we are supporting each other in this recommendation. Well, now it has more merit right? Because it's not just one. We both recognize the value of this proposal and are willing to contribute financially with staffing in, in various ways and show explicitly how it aligns with our strategic plan, the county's plan. The, those alignment pieces, we design it in, we bake it in with support letters, with um, town hall presentations, right? We show up for each other and then all of a sudden we have more, um, we have more impact, right? We have more credibility. We have more why behind where, why this money should come here. And again, partnership, which is what this is all about. You're able to express to the board or the council that the library is not putting the bill all by itself. And we're not taking all the manpower from staff. We're bringing in others to partner with this and share their experiences, share their thoughts, share their um, resources, share materials. So it's not just the library providing the overall or the big piece. We're providing a service, but the service itself is coming from outside. So there again, we're showing community outreach. We're showing involvement. We're showing the support and love to the community. So. That would be my two cents. What we're starting something. Uh, oh, are we trying to end or can I add one more thing? No, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, something that, um, you know, when when something grows quickly and uh, you add all these different people and positions and vehicles, uh, it can start getting messy and people tend to because we're going so fast. Uh, what we've discovered is that we, uh, are needing to have almost like an intake system. We have different people. Uh, we're, we're finding that we are sometimes duplicating our efforts because we're not talking to each other because we're, everybody is, is uh, working with partners and doing this that, that we needed to develop something to bring it together. So right now we are working on almost uh, a ticket system, if you will, when requests, whether they're internal, external, for various events, programming, uh, goes through a ticket system and then our managers vet those. Because what we want is we want to do use our resources um, nice. in a smart way. So we want to get the right vehicle with the right personnel to the right event so that we can have the greatest impact. And a part of that is going to be then the feedback loop in that then we will evaluate what happened so that it helps us plan. It's a place to have your, yes, our statistics and our data, but what happened? And should we do this again? Was it valuable? And with so many people um, doing great work and it's all great work and it's valuable, but this is another way of evaluating uh, what the impact is. And another uh, thing to do is don't forget your impact stories. Uh, to write them down in the moment we get excited about what's happening and then we move on to the next thing. Take time to reflect, write those impact stories down because uh, boards, councils, funders, they want to hear those stories. How will this make a difference? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, and I just wanted to jump in really quickly. I put this in the chat, uh, but we're now kind of in our kind of open conversation. So if any of our, our three or four panelists uh, or anyone else needs to sign off, um, please feel free to do so at any point. But I 
want to thank you all and and also encourage people to stay on if you're able to. We're we're hoping to kind of continue conversing for another another 25 minutes and just kind of an open an open way. Um, and and I'd love to. And uh, uh, Amelia doesn't know I'm going to do this, but uh, I, I'm going to ask uh, my um, uh, graduate assistant Amelia Medrano. Um, to kind of say a few words. Uh, Amelia is also a public librarian uh, in, in rural Western North Carolina. So Amelia, as, as you're hearing all this great content, um, how do things uh, look different or the same uh, in rural North Carolina? Hi. Yep, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So I think a lot of this um, actually just really solidify some of the work that my library is doing, reaching out to different partners in the community already, which is great, because that's just affirming what's going on for the, the rural library setting as well. One of the things that I really loved about um, today's presentation um, was something that Becky said, you plan with your community, not at your community. And I think that just really, um, that, that's the whole idea of our partnerships and why we're, um, you know, in it to support our community. It's not just what the library wants to do on its own. It's how we can um, help those people in our community to make connections and learn about different services that are available to them. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Amelia. Um, yeah. Oh, and I'd love to just invite anyone, anyone else at this point uh, to just, uh, everyone has uh, uh, the ability to unmute. You can put things in the chat. Let's, let's really, yeah, just, just have a conversation. How are, how are things resonating? What, um, how do, how do things compare with your experiences? Um, is there anything that you've tried that's either worked very well uh, <laughs> or that you've, you've really struggled with? Uh, it's, it's completely open right now. So I thought I might add uh, just a little bit about a really lovely partnership that we have in South County, um, which is the more rural part of our county. There's a nonprofit called SoCo Grow. So it's South County uh, growing. And what I love about that partnership is, A, it was designed in the library. Like they don't have a physical space. So they've planned all of their programs for years with the library. and. They're promoted in our newsletter, on our webpage, and then they use our space and collaborate us, uh, collaborate with us um, with the space. So things like planting a pizza garden, um, having a South County Fiesta where it was in partnership with our Hispanic Health Fair. And so then it was kind of a reprise of some of those partners, but in South County, which geographically is kind of removed from some of the agencies. So we had a dental uh, bus where they came and did uh, toothbrushes, but then we also had the lovely restaurant from down the street who came and brought salsa. And then we hired people to come and salsa dance, right? You see the play, right? Come on, library pun. But it was just, it was a blast. So we had our health partners. I sometimes lovingly think of that as the broccoli, right? It's good for us. But with the library, we're allowed to bring the cotton candy, which meant that we had the bounce house and the dance and the music and the salsa and the businesses and the, and it was just beautiful, you know? And I love that. I love how the library can add such beautiful permission to play, to have fun, to bring balloons. We're allowed, you know, we, we don't have to have a curriculum. We don't have to force people to sit in their seats, you know, maybe for a little, but then we're allowed to maybe wiggle outside and do a story walk. So I think that's been one of the gifts really is seeing the library inside, outside, the parking lot, like all of that is opportunity. And I feel like, yeah, that's even more so in some of my rural spaces because they have space. Um, and so it looks different. And up in Brooklyn Park, which is more urban, right? As mentioned, it's near Baltimore City. There's additional growing opportunities. We worked with the Watershed Steward Academy and they came and planted trees because we know that the, the connection between trees and health 
um, lowering the, the temperature, right? Like the literal temperature of, of urban environments and the way that that impacts children and families. So it's, it's pretty cool, right? Because it is so expansive. So I'll stop. No, yeah, I, I think that's that's uh, that's so so great, Becky, and and hearing about uh, again what you said that tailored approaches where it's going to look different in South County compared to to the northern part of your county based on the different demographics and just communities in those areas, um, um, and um, yeah, I think I think that's great, and I'm hearing seeing a few things come come in on the chat. Um, one one thing that uh, I wanted to to come back to, um, uh, well, 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 two things really quickly. Uh, Amelia, um, if you if you wouldn't mind, could you uh, reinsert kind of the links to our our jam boards uh, and also our Padlet, which are are some more vehicles for people to kind of um, share share their experiences. Um, but uh, if if people are are kind of taking a look at those, um, I wanted to return to something Anna you said a minute ago about your ticketing system. Um, and and one thing that I'm always curious about, and I think is really important, but is is sometimes hard hard to do, is how do we keep track of all these relationships? Uh, if if we kind of uh, work collaboratively with so many different entities, uh, with so many different library staff, um, having so many fingers on so many different different organizations and coalitions. Um, how do we how do we keep track of it all? Um, and uh, yeah, I'd love to just I'll just kind of open question for our panelists and, and everyone else uh, on this Zoom call kind of what have you found uh, works uh, in terms of keeping track of all all the relationships that you all cultivate? Well, well, sometimes well, go ahead. I was going to say, like every good librarian, Excel. Mm -hmm. I mean, you need a spreadsheet <laughs> you <start> somewhere. And <laughs> yes. when we we did start doing that, and uh, we ended up having hundreds on our list, and then we got, got deep into the weeds of what is a partner, who's a collaborator. Well, they gave us coupons one year. Are they a partner? But this person gave us twenty five thousand, and this person did a program for us, and so it's. It's kind of getting in the weeds and figuring out what, what does it mean to be a partner? Um, and that might look different for different organizations. There are, are different levels of how we work with, with people and understanding that. that, that uh, and I, I wish I could tell you we have figured that out. We're always talking about that. We, we tried using teams and using notes and creating uh, almost like a field for every single partner where we where we track things and anybody that's working with that partner is going to add their notes so that we're not duplicating and that pe partners know who am I supposed to talk to? Do I talk to the community engagement person or am I supposed to talk to, wait, you're the program person. And I think sometimes that's confusing to the partner. They've lost track of who they're supposed to talk to. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're working, that's why we're trying to stay ahead of it with this ticket system, which is not complete yet. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that the community, when they do an ask, we're doing our part in giving them good feedback and not giving them the runaround as well. Mm -hmm. We also use a lot of working documents where we'll put stuff. So maybe it's a noun like gardens, right? And then we just put everything there. And we try to go through it periodically to update it to make sure that it's actually, you know, accurate and representational of what we're doing. Um, and then sometimes I'll just send it out again of like, can you just take a peek? Is this still accurate? Am I missing anything? And just ask human, right? We always miss stuff. So, um, so yeah, I would agree spreadsheets. We also use the invite the library form. So I put that in the chat for anyone who's interested. That's been really helpful for us. We try to do, as I mentioned, tailored service. So working with the branch that is the closest geographically, because we want to really amplify those relationships, right? We want to make sure that the people that they're working with, maybe they see them at summer, then they see them at back to school night, then they're coming in and they're working on something you know what I'm saying? So that it builds momentum and it builds um, another moment to, to keep connecting that dot between the partner and the library. 
um, because it is, it's that momentum piece so that we recognize it's going to be a long term process. These are not short term processes. Relationship building takes time. So I think that's another key piece is how do we budget our time? Because it's not just keeping track of the spreadsheets, because we know that's a full time gig, right? But it's um, setting that priority for ourselves to have the time for reflection, to have the time to go into the community and have that cup of coffee. You know, it's that human moment, taking time to connect with someone when they're in a moment of a pain point. I think that was true for a lot of us during COVID, right? And so having that space to be like, how are you? I think that is huge, quite honestly. And if we gave ourselves time in our schedule to, to really have that space with each other, and that's internal partner as well as external partner. Let's just have that moment, right? Um, so, so yeah, these pieces of collaboration, it's expansive, but it's also internal that we need to pause and, and do those check-ins um, and ask those questions. Um, and so the working documents are, are one of my cheat sheet ways to just get it all out there. That way nobody owns the document. It's a collaboration document. And I also share it with external partners so they can put stuff in there too, right? And so then that becomes another tool for us for um, between meeting collaboration. Well, I'm going to sign off. I have to be back at the desk at five. So this has been wonderful. Thank you for including me. And I appreciate all of the information I've heard and learned. And hopefully keep in touch with me so I can continue to learn and grow and grow the library community. Thank you all and have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Maxine. Um, yeah, I hope you have a good uh, good rest of your day. Um, and if other if others need to sign off, yeah, feel feel free to do so. Um, but yeah, I'll I'll just uh, take a moment um, and see if anyone. Uh, we have about thirty six people still in the Zoom room. Um, if, have any of you been kind of uh, listening away? Uh, feel like you might might want to uh, share with us uh, using your microphone. We'd love to hold space for you to, to share your experiences um, if, if you wish to do so. So I'll just uh, pause for a minute and see if anyone uh, would like to like to chime in with with their experiences or a question. And not not seeing anything come in right now. I'd love to uh, Becky and and Anna. Um, do you have questions for each other? Uh, has there been something that's come up that's kind of sparked your curiosity that you you may want to to know more about? Um, how how do your approaches uh, compare or differ based on on what you've you've heard today? A well, question I have for Becky is when you said you have something called invite the library form. Can you explain to us what that is and how it's used? Yeah, so I dropped it in the chat um, and you're welcome to copy and paste. That's Great. my favorite thing about libraries is yeah. that we are all about the copy paste. Um, and I've I've shared that a, a couple of different places. Um, so this came out of when I was working with the Enoch Pratt Free Library. I had been with Pratt for, which, which is Baltimore City. Um, and so we used this when we were trying to plan Oh, anytime that people would call and be like, hey, can the library come and do X, Y, Z? And that could be anything from an info table to uh, a presentation. Maybe it's um, sharing resources with a genealogy club or um, business association meetings or, you know, it really could be anything. Um, and then classroom visits, right? Some of our... Um, more traditional structures like uh, child care providers and visiting um, different daycare centers and things like that. Um, so this is a tool for us to gather the information that we know our branches are going to ask us, 
everything from, you know, just really practical stuff like when, where, and it allows the partner to say, we'd really prefer for it to be this branch because we have so many branches. That's part of our challenge. Um, so sometimes it'll be um, a place that is actually supported by multiple branches for a variety of reasons, like Fort Meade. I mean, that's a huge area of our county. Um, so how that then gets shared is that we email it to the branch and the branch kind of gets first dip, right? The closest branch, they're the place of first point connection because they're the one in the neighborhood, right? So we try to do that place-based service in how we um, matchmake, right? And then if they're not able to accommodate for a variety of reasons, staffing, other obligations or whatever, then we can uh, look at it maybe at a regional level and look at it for the northern part of the county. Okay, maybe this branch isn't able to because of staffing challenges. Maybe this branch is able to, and then we're able to kind of tag team. I think that's actually been one of our, yeah, growing edges is trying to uh, recognize that our customers don't necessarily identify like this is the northern part of the county or the southern part. You know, that that might not be their framework. They might just be, I want to do everything on this side of the map. <laughs> and so then it's up to us to make sure that we're balancing that out with our resources so that we are good stewards of our energy, our time, um, and our resources, right? So yeah, it's um, it's a tool like everything else. And sometimes it works really well and is pretty straightforward. And then other times it's too messy and I pick up the phone and I call somebody and I'm like, can you tell me more, right? It's my favorite line. I, I'm also a coach. So sometimes it's just, give me a little more information, right? There's nuance that I'm missing. Maybe there's a noun. Uh, help, help paint the picture for me of what you're hoping for so that I can make sure that we're clear on what those expectations are so that then we can kind of navigate and sometimes have to compromise about what we can and can't do. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I just, I just uh, pulled it up here too. Very helpful, thank you. Yeah, and, and I, I love that as well. And I, I also love, Becky, about what you said about kind of uh, sometimes, uh, I mean, these forms can be really useful, but so, and sometimes you really just need to have a conversation because there's only so much forms can can kind of communicate. Um, and and it reminded me uh, uh, a little bit ago in the chat, uh, I saw a question about kind of um, uh, the value of kind of a formal written uh, like memorandum of understanding or some sort of formal partnership agreement. Um, and I'd love to just hear any any thoughts or reflections you have about um, when kind of that formal kind of agreement uh, may be necessary and when kind of something more tacit or informal may be, may be the most appropriate. Um, uh, is, do you all have processes? Is it more kind of, um, yeah, um, yeah, just how, how do you, yeah, the, the, the different levels of formality that the partnerships can have and how we navigate that, if that makes sense. Um, at Gail Borden, um, we do have what's called a, our program agreements. And I think what you have to be careful when we start going into this area is records retention and confidentiality. And then you have to get lawyers involved. And so it can get, it can get kind of messy. So be careful how much information you're asking, how much information you're holding and what you're asking. You know, anytime you ask somebody to sign something, Make sure that you have had that vetted, that, you know, uh, people above you know you're doing that. Uh, something that we did with Gold Star Partners, we call it Gold Star Partner. It's a very simple, it's three things that we're asking you to do. They're not signing anything. They're just checking a box saying, I've read it. I know what you're expecting of me. And it's not so much a legal contract. But when you start having those MOUs and like we've dealt with the school district and and it honestly, it has stalled a lot of things because it it's like it's so messy and big that we could have been doing the work in a different way. And I know that it's necessary sometimes, uh, but we do not have a formal 
memorandum of understanding. Maybe some municipal libraries do. Um, I, I don't know if they're working with the city and they have to have those. Um, we do not have anything formalized like that. Becky, how about how about you? Yeah, we have a range of different things because we have to. So for example, within our school system, there are uh, what we call duty centers and they have a very formal MOU process. It goes through like, I'm, I'm being facetious, but it feels like 400 people. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's a process. Anything that has to get signed like that has to go through the CEO. Like there's a very formal structure that's been outlined through our board of trustees. So all of that has a very concrete process that quite frankly is above my pay grade, but I can help sometimes facilitate, right? Making sure that people have access and, and know who to connect to, right? His executive administrator. And then I can be CC'd to help kind of, um, the, the image that comes to mind is WD-40. Right, like sometimes I'm in that space of just helping to smooth those um, those journeys, right? Especially if it's someone who maybe wants a more formal process. Um, we've been able to kind of negotiate some of that um, so that maybe it's a pilot that maybe doesn't have a formal process at this stage. And then maybe down the road, it becomes a formal process. So I, it really has depended on um, the partnerships and what their needs are for a billion reasons, right? Everything you just described um, because of, of information. So for example, when we're working with Department of Social Services, they have a whole lot of different things that we obviously don't. And so we lean toward intellectual freedom and some of those value-driven processes that are intrinsic to library service. Um, but sometimes I think library folks, we take it for granted that people understand some of our um, perspective on privacy. And so we have had to have some kind of hard conversations about what we keep, what information we keep, why we don't keep some information, um, especially working with the school system. You know, that's another really important uh, partner. So, so yeah, I think, you know, we as library information professionals take privacy very seriously and, and we should. Um, so then that gives us extra um, vigilance around not keeping information, um, how we do our contracts and things like that. Uh, and of course, working with our legal counsel as needed to make sure that we're on the right path um, because we're not lawyers and we don't want to be. So yeah, I think sometimes it is a bit of a um, yeah negotiation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Becky. And 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 think that this is great advice. And and I love Anna as well, the idea of a checklist rather than like a signed uh, agreement, uh, making it a little bit uh, more approachable and less less legalistic. Um, um uh just just kind of as we get close to to the 4:30 uh mark on the east coast um i thought uh, the, uh i thought a question came in that i think may be a good place to end on um uh diane wrote um uh she recently moved uh from a small town where where everybody knew everybody um uh into a large city and and she's struggling to kind of now now build relationships in a new city um and and do you have any any kind of just general advice? And maybe you've encountered this uh, as you're onboarding new staff. Um, how do you how do you in any kind of advice uh, if if you're new to a city? How do you how do you get started building relationships as a librarian? Any any kind of um, general thoughts or advice? So I would share that one of my favorite um, images is to get as librarian as you can like really dial it up, give yourself permission to be your own librarian, like go whole hog, look at newspaper articles, uh, look up the bulletin boards at Panera. Like, I mean, truly like just get curious. Um, that's one piece that has served me really well. Uh, another is to ask for some of those warm handoff moments, right? Like when you're talking with your boss, your mentor, your colleague, you know, who, who are some of the connectors? Uh, I like the, the book Blink. That's been fun because there's a lot on, on the connector role, right? Who are the connectors? 
ask the question and then say, hey, can we go out for lunch with that person? Mm -hmm. Like get human, find out what, what it is that's going to connect and lean toward your strengths too, right? Like I'm a knitter. So sometimes I will go and sit at the local knitting place and just ask some questions. Like, so tell me about this neighborhood. What, what, what do you think are some of this neighborhood's strengths? And, um, and it's fun. It's fun to listen um, to the community and, and they love to talk about their strengths. I, I don't think I've ever been in a place where they weren't willing to brag on themselves at least a little bit. Um, yeah, so those opportunities to be human and connect with people at that human level, I think has been really powerful because then it helps when things get messy and hard and sticky and when some of the complicated things come to surface you know you have more grounding because you've started at that human level because you care and you're all trying to support the community together um, and that you're part of that solution so yeah, I, I've sometimes said, I think maybe we just need to have a cup of coffee with this one. Let me set that up and then you come with me, right? And then we'll do that warm connection moment um, so that we can then step into the formal meeting with a little bit more than just a cold, like, I don't even know who you are. I don't know why you're here, <laughs> right? They'll, no, they'll be like, oh, right. There's that nice person who came with Becky. I remember she's one of Becky's. All right, come on in, right? And so then it's, it builds the village, it builds that connection, and you're working again with, um, but that does take some time. So I would say, try to be patient with yourself, try to be gentle with yourself. Um, I think sometimes we want quick, and the reality is this is the human part, and sometimes that might not be possible yet. Um, and the small wins, I, I can't say enough, right? Give yourself permission to really notice and name explicitly those small wins for yourself because they're there. Trust me, they, they are. And start with uh, something you're already interested in. You know, if, if you ride bikes and you go and meet the local bike guy, you know, and strike up a conversation, you know, we, we all like to do things that we're driven by things that we're interested in. And that, that's sort of a, a, an easy one. So I, I would say, you know, something that you have a passion for and start building, that's a more natural, instead of maybe jumping into an area that I have no idea what this is about, but, you know, whether it's knitting, bike riding, you know, the Rako Rangers was born out of work. That branch is a small library. It's, it's a lead certified. It, we, we drew up our strengths and we built it around the capacity we had for that branch. Another branch couldn't do that, but they can do something else. It's looking at what you have and building on that strength. So um, I guess that would be my advice. If, if you're looking to, to connect with somebody, what are you interested in that that's going to excite you? Um, and I think that would be an easier, um, easier sell. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Anna and Becky, for um, yeah. As as you alluded to, your your time is precious. So so thank you so much for taking the time to share your your information and inspiration with us. Um, uh, just just to kind of close things out. Um, uh, so like I said, this is uh, the first of four conversations we'll be having throughout the month of April. Um, our next next Thursday, we're going to have um, sparking change. Um, uh, branch managers uh, and library directors perspective. So how uh, how do how do people at the, the the top of the leadership, so to speak, uh, uh, build buy-in and and build build passion around this? Um, um, and so uh, please uh, feel free to share this with others. Uh, the recording of this event will or of our first conversation will be shared with all registrants next Monday. So if you missed anything, you can go back um, and see that. Um, and I just want to end with a story very quickly um, uh, that connects Anna what what you were saying uh, about bicycling with something I learned in Anne Arundel County about uh, starting with your interests. Um, uh, Becky, uh, I don't know if you know this, but I, I heard from uh, one of your staff members that I interviewed um, about how a really impactful program came about because uh, a library staff member was bicycling around Anne Arundel County. Um, 
on on a weekend um, and happened to come across a farm stand um, and they're like, oh, I'm going to go check out this farm stand. Um, and they talked with the farmers um, and found out they were one of uh, a minuscule small uh, Hispanic owned farm, uh, one of the very one of the very few farms owned by by um, people of uh, Latin American descent, Hispanic descent, and and they're like, wow, this is really interesting. Um, let's let's see if we can feature these these people. And so they did kind of some virtual programs um, out at the farm and really shone a light on on that, and also highlighting issues of equity uh, and inclusion in the agricultural sector. And so it was just really, really beautiful and really speaks to exactly what you're saying about kind of start with things that you're interested in and 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 go out and build connections and see where they take you. Um, but uh, but yeah, I want to I want to thank you uh, all again, both uh, uh, Anna and Becky and, and Maxine and Stacy, uh, Amelia, um, everyone who chose the time to spend with us today. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and let's keep sharing and building. Um, and and cultivating the relationship driven library so so thank you so much for for your time and have a good uh, good day great thank you thanks noah take good care bye bye